Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, welcome uh, uh, on this, what is rather a cold day. Um, thank you for joining us uh, this Tuesday afternoon. Um, this webinar is uh, titled Strategies in Response to High Fertilizer Prices, uh, Planning for 2022. Uh, it's a joint event uh, between SAC Consulting and ADAS and is funded by the Scottish Farm Advisory Service. I'll be chairing the event. My colleague Craig Holthwell is in the background pulling all the strings. Um, this webinar uh, is uh, prioritizing cereals and oil seeds. Uh, if we do have any forage inquiries, um, Craig will um, be the go-to man to deal with those. Uh, alternatively, you can uh, post your questions and if we don't respond, we'll try and respond after the event. Um, Joining us today, uh, also, uh, and we're grateful to have on board is uh, Roger Sylvester Bradley. Uh, Roger will be known to many of you, I'm sure. Uh, Roger is head of crop performance with ADAS. And uh, after a few slides from myself, uh, Roger will give us a, a more in depth uh, a look. Um, the agenda's in front of you. We, um, we hope uh, to be around 40 minutes or maybe a little more if we've got questions. Um, after the brief introduction, I'll just touch on current prices in the uh, marketplace at the moment um, and look at the uh, impact on crop gross margins. Uh, and then uh, Roger will cover off um, his views on managing expensive nitrogen and uh, a brief view on how we can mitigate against uh, manuf manufactured end cost. Um, uh, Q A's will be at the end. Um, if you do have uh, a question uh, during the presentation, um, uh, encourage you to click on the Q and A tab, um, which should appear on your screen when you join the webinar. Um, Craig will see your questions and then he'll pop those up to us um, as a prompt to uh, respond. If you want to send something privately to Craig, you can do that in the chat box. Um, we'll record this uh, webinar and uh, it will be available uh, if you want to view it uh, or pick up on anything uh, in the slides that you might have missed. Uh, it'll be available on the FAS website um, at a later uh, date. Um, so we have a large number of people in attendance, which is good, uh, and we thought uh, just to make the uh, most of that, we'll insert uh, three polls. Uh, we'll do a couple um, now, and then Roger's got one within his presentation, just to gauge, uh, well, from, from both your perspective and our perspective, what, uh, where we are uh, in terms of, firstly, what percentage of your 2022 N requirement have you purchased to date? Uh, could you please respond? And we'll put the results up shortly. Um, none, one quarter, half, three quarters, or all. Um, I'm not sure where the uh, industry average lies. Um, so it'll be interesting to see um, uh, the results of that and we can feed that back to you. Okay. Um, there'll be another poll to follow uh, and Craig will insert that when we get a chance. Right. Um, so I'm just going to um, touch on um, Fertilizer prices uh, historically. Um, can you? Oh, I've moved that. Great. Okay, I'll move that poll out of the way. So, a couple of slides from me before um, we talk to Roger. And I thought it would be interesting just to look at how fertilizer prices have moved really over the last 18 months. And the two columns on the left hand side, where it says summer 20 and summer 21, were the actual figures that. Um, I lifted from the uh, SAC Farm Management Handbook, um, which <laughs> I'm sure some of you will reference, but you'll see in the uh, issue that's just been released, the summer 2021 figures, which we compiled sort of August, September time, we, were, we, we put in 340 for nitrogen and, and 495 for triple superphosphate and 420 uh, for potash. And that lifted up from the previous edition back in the summer, autumn of 2020 from 226. 
ammonium nitrate, two fifty triple superphosphate, and, and two four seven muro to potash. Uh, and then the last column on the on the uh, right is where we are now. Um, and the six ninety is a figure that both Roger will refer to um, in his. Um, slides and, and so I've used a figure, you, it may be slightly less than that, it might be slightly more. Um, and those indicative figures of 525 and 535 of, of where we are on, on, on TSP and MOP. So, you know, a considerable lift um, over the last 18 months. Um, but I, I think surprisingly, when you look at it in the context of gross margins and crop prices, um, you may be surprised that the impact isn't as great as one might have thought. Um, so if we have a look at those, Craig, on the next slide, um, what I've done is, is for winter wheat, uh, spring barley and all seed rape, is just to look at the standard uh, budget gross margin um, over the last 18 months. Um, so in this example, I've taken winter wheat, and the first two columns on the left, again, are out of the, uh, the data that's actually in the, the agricultural costings book um, for uh, a winter wheat crop that has an average yield of eight tonnes a hectare and, and gets an application of 200 kilograms of N. And back in, in, in 2020, when we were budgeting for the 21 harvest, um, we had grain in at 150 pounds a tonne. Um, and fertilizer at 202, and we were looking at a margin of, of 989. In the summer that's just gone, when we just released a new edition, we had grain in at 180, uh, fertilizer in at, uh, at uh, 327, and we were looking at a budgeted gross margin for the 2022 harvest of 1142. Now, um, you may or may not realize 210 pounds a ton for new crop. Um, but let's assume uh, we do. Uh, we've put that £690 a tonne uh, in on the fertiliser costings there, where it says 552. And you can see actually that uh, we're making slightly more money, uh, potentially, if we realise these, realize these grain prices than we uh, were budgeting for um, six months ago. Uh, and certainly, um, you know, 20% more than we were budgeting for uh, 12 months ago, uh, 18 months ago. Um, uh, and th therein perhaps lies the crux of the matter is that, um, you know, that is full rate, no nitrogen cut, cut back at 200 um, kgs event. So there is a story there, which I'm sure Roger will allude to, that there is a scope to optimise on that gro gross margin even further. So if we go on to the next slide and look at uh, spring barley, we've done the same exercise and, and, and this is a feed barley at 130 kilos of N, and you may realize more than 180 pounds a tonne if you get it away from halting. Um, but we've taken 5.5 tonnes a hectare, and you can see that uh, the, the three um, budgeted uh, gross margins were, were, were 613 for the 2021 harvest, um, uh, and originally 707 uh, for the 22 harvest. And, and latterly, with the increase in the uplift in price, on the uplift in FERT again, although we've seen, uh, you know, 150 pounds on the fertilizer bill, um, we're seeing not a similar margin. Uh, and I think the, perhaps the question is slightly often more difficult to gauge is how much do we cut back on spring barley uh, uh, compared to wheat? Uh, and I'm sure probably Roger will have a view on that. Um, lastly, um, all seed rape. And we've applied 200 uh, kilograms of N as per um, uh, the costings at four tonnes a hectare. And I'm not sure where we'll be on, on rape uh, for 22, um, but we've put in 540 pounds a tonne. Uh, and you can see that the gross margin actually is uh, considerably better than, than the, the budget for uh, 2021 harvest. Uh, and not dissimilar to where we were budgeting for six months ago. Um, and it is just brings, it brings you back to this uh, issue of actually look at the net margin 
um, and uh, uh, and it's, it's, a, it's the correlation between grain value and fertilizer input price. And then we can graphically illustrate this just to just to make it um, a bit more clearer. In so much as that the the green uh, bar chart there on the right is, is the corresponds to the column that was on the right in the charts. Um, uh, and uh, perhaps we shouldn't be. Uh, bemoaning uh, too much um, in light of the potential uplift in, in, in gross margins per hectare uh, compared to last year. Um, the question is actually, you know, how much more can we improve or lift the margin on that uh, green column if we um, cut out that the top tier of nitrogen that is now deemed to be um, not giving us a response in terms of uh, increased grain value. Um, so that's really just a summary as a background um, uh, introduction uh, to um, current costings. Um, they, uh, we have the opportunity to do another poll. Um, uh, if that's ready, Craig, um, do put it up. Or if you have the results from the previous poll, put those up. Um, okay, so uh, fertilizer purchase. So 51% haven't um, uh, purchased any fertilizer yet. So that's probably not unsurprising. 14% um, have purchased all, three quarters, 5%. Um, 24 percent have purchased half so there's still quite a big exposure to the market um, we have a second poll question um, if that's available to put up uh, and this one is uh, what price bracket do you expect your nitrogen spend per ton to be uh, for harvest 2022 do you think it will uh, be before, between 250 and 400 um, 400 to 550, 550 to 700, or more than 700 pounds a ton. Um, so, if you could give that some thought, and I know, you know, there's going to be cost uh, for urea or ammonium nitrate, but we didn't want to make it too <laughs> complicated. Um, so, uh, if you feel either your urea purchase or, 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 or ammonium nitrate purchase are falling one of those bags, if you could put it in there. Okay, super. Um, uh, I'd like to just uh, introduce Roger. Um, does that uh, poll surprise you, Roger, only 50%? Um, you're mute still, so you need to turn your mic on. Yes, sir. Yes, thanks, Craig. Um, yes, I, I'm, it's, it's worrying. Uh, it'd be good to ask, um, well, th this current poll that you've got there, um, we, we need to presumably say ammonium nitrate or something because the um, ah here we go yeah I suppose whether it's a urea or ammonium nitrate is was it going to be another 50, 60, 70 pounds difference so yeah. potentially I mean you, you, uh, ammonium nitrate is four hundred and sixty kilograms of nutrient per ton whereas sorry ammonium nitrate is three hundred three hundred forty five whereas you get 460 for yeah, urea. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but it looks like the prices are quite high that people are expecting to. Um, I mean, it could pay. be that, that, you know, some people have um, purchased some of their fertilizer and, and the average is uh, they might have bought for 2 two ninety early on and they're going to have to top up with some more expensive stuff, which will average yeah. now for, for the four yeah. to 550. But, uh, it's, there's still a lot of exposure in the market, isn't there? But it's, uh, uh, yeah. Of it. um, yeah, so um, over to you, Roger, um, uh, just to perhaps delve a bit deeper into um, how we deal with these uh, and what is the potential impact of these high uh, fertilizer prices and what we can do about it. Yeah. So hopefully you can see my screen now. Yes, yes. So, um, well, good afternoon, everybody, and, and good to be able to speak to you. And um, uh, this, you must recognize that I have operated most of my career in England. I actually am planning to move home to Scotland fairly soon, but um, 
but it's going to be a whole new learning experience. Um, the last time I lived in Scotland was when I was a student. So um, what I want to cover is, is the way nitrogen affects your crops and, um, and then to think about what the higher value of the nitrogen that you have or haven't bought, actually what difference that makes to the management of each individual crop. And then at the end, move towards thinking about general farm strategy and what the difference makes into the future. And, and it would be interesting to know when we get to the discussion, what your views are about the uh, higher prices being sustained into the future. Um, but to begin at the beginning, uh, obviously, I'm a biologist, I'm a crop physiologist, I try to understand the way nutrients affect crops, and how it affects their yields. But um, in the end, the decisions you make are economic decisions. So I'm going to try and deal with the economics, the sort of overlay of economics that there is over and above the biology. So, and, and it's important in these documents, I've got three of the many documents that deal with uh, recommendations for nitrogen. So that there's the uh, technical note 731 from SAC, but there's also um, the AHDB's RB209. And there's also, uh, dear to my heart, because I wrote it, uh, the um, back in the days of the HGCA, we produced a more detailed um, uh, guidebook that deals entirely with nitrogen on winter wheat um, and goes through all the, the sort of biological considerations as well as the economic ones. But uh, the recommendations are all given uh, from economic, uh, on a uh, on basis of economic calculations. And so we need to get to understand those calculations. Um, what we've, uh, gen I'm, I'm more and more trying to do my research with farmers rather than for farmers. So, and what we're learning more and more as we do that is that there's a, in, when we look at all the variation, and that's what scientists are really interested in, actually, the largest part of the controllable variation is between farms. So there's a lot you can learn by talking to each other and, and understanding what the differences are uh, between you. And, and you, so you need to be making measurements on your own farm to discriminate your sort of, to recognize the difference, the way that you differ from other farms. Um, and I'm, I'm going to come back to the sort of whole farm picture at the end. But to start with the biology, nitrogen is primarily used um, to form the photosynthetic, the marvelous photosynthetic enzyme that allows us to fix carbon dioxide uh, using solar energy. And it's the, basically the root of all life. And um, that's the primary purpose. As we bred wheat to yield more and more and more, actually the quantity that gets moved into the grain tends to exceed the quantity that you need in the leaves. Um, and uh, so uh, high yielding cereal crops need more nitrogen than the leaves, the, 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 the grain needs more than the leaves did need. So we have to keep that nitrogen going into the crop and the sort of break even between low yield and high yield I'm talking about is about nine tons per hectare. So I'm assuming you're all growing nice high yielding crops so that you're Crop demand depends on the crop yield and the nitrogen concentration of that grain. Um, and then there's some nitrogen that you get free. It's not necessarily free because it might be the fertilizer from last year left over, or it might be um, provided from organic manures or things like that. But, but also from your soil organic matter, a certain amount of nitrogen comes from the soil supply. And that is the most variable part of the whole calculations that we're going to have to do. So it's the most important thing to try and to understand. The recommendations generally try and understand it in relation to previous crop and soil type. But then there's a gap between the soil supply and the crop demand, which has to be met by applied 
uh, nitrogen, either in the form of fertilizer or organic manures. And it's important to recognize that those fertilizers or manures are not used with 100%, almost never used with 100% efficiency. So we have to understand the inefficiencies of the products that we're applying and try uh, to mitigate those. So the if you're using urea, then a portion of that will be volatilized uh, in, in sort of cold and wet conditions. Generally, it's a small proportion, but it can be up to 20% or more of the of total nitrogen that you apply gets volatilized into the, as ammonia into the atmosphere. Um, but that's it, it, if you're not applying urea and uh, you're using uh, ammonium nitrate, um, you only get a very little bit of ammonia emitted. But the main inefficiency is through competition between your crop and the soil, the soil um, microbes. So uh, about 30 or 40 percent of the fertilizer that you apply gets locked up by the microbiology in your soil and, and retained into the future, whether it's lost by leaching or gets into the next crop is a, uh, a moot point, but it doesn't get into this crop. And the proportion that gets locked up is very variable, but generally it's about 30 or 40%. So your fertilizer is about on average 60% efficient. Um, so the, the sum that you need to do to work out what your fertilizer requirement is, is the crop demand minus the soil supply divided by the fertilizer efficiency or recovery, as we call it. Um, uh, so just for an example, if the crop needs 200 kilograms per hectare in the crop by the time it's formed, it's, say, 10 tons per hectare of yield. Um, and uh, the, the soil is providing 80 kilograms per hectare, which is a pretty average sort of quantity that a soil might provide, then you're needing to fertilize to provide that 120 kilograms difference. And if your fertilizer is working at 60% efficiency, then you need to apply 200 kilograms in order to get the 120 kilograms into the crop. Now, the, 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 that's the biology. Now let's get to the economics. Basically, you if it, you keep on applying nitrogen until the extra grain you get uh, doesn't pay for the extra nitrogen, the last kilogram that you apply, and that's that's the right point to stop. So, um, I, I just want to know now, as I um, move into the economics, how you think your crops respond to nitrogen. So, Craig's going to put up a poll. I hope. And um, we're asking you whether you think that the, the sort of last 50 kilograms of what you apply gives back 0.3 of a ton, 0.5 of a ton, one ton or five tons. So if you pull back by 50 kilograms from what you normally apply, assuming you normally apply the right amount, what do you think? is the response. I don't know how long I have to wait for you all to vote. But I, my next slide has the answer on it in the form of a graph. I'll just give it another two or three seconds, Roger, we're at 50% voted. Okay. Right, that'll do, Roger. Uh, Roger, I'll just stop it now. Okay. Well, here are the answers coming. So this this graph that you can now see uh, without any dots or lines on it is the graph I've been drawing for most of my adult life, as we do hundreds of these experiments. So uh, along the bottom, we've got increasing amounts of nitrogen, the nutrient, not the fertilizer, so the nutrient, the amounts applied in kilograms per hectare. And at the left hand side, we have uh, the increases in grain yield, which go from four tons up to 11 tons. And on the right hand side, we have increases in grain protein. And what we see when we apply increasing amounts of fertilizer is a, a curve that starts, uh, obviously, 
only being fed by the soil supply. So we measure the soil supply by knowing the yield and the nitrogen content of that yield uh, with uh, no fertilizer applied. And this may be, you know, as I was saying before, about uh, 80 kilograms per hectare, which would form about five tons of grain per hectare. But then as we move up to say 100 kilograms per hectare, we move from five tons to nine tons. So you get a huge benefit from that first 100 kilograms. But then the second, if we say that the optimum level, and you'll see where the optimal level is in a minute, but if the optimum level is about 200 kilograms, then you're only getting about a ton per hectare or a bit more from that last 100 kilograms. And uh, actually, the, if we look at the economic optimum at a break-even ratio, so that's the ratio, the number of kilograms of grain you need to pay for a kilogram of nitrogen. And in, in the Scottish recommendations, that's currently set at three to one. In the AHDB RB209 recommendations, that's currently set at five to one. And uh, the, the price, uh, the, the new prices that Mark introduced and, and spoke about before me uh, really produce a, a ratio of something like 10 to one. So the optima have changed from sort of two, with three to one, it's about 220, with five to one, it's about 200, and with 10 to one, it's about 150. And the amount of grain that you lose, yield that you lose from going, from adjusting from five to one down to 10 to one, so putting 50 kilograms per hectare less is only about 0.3 of a ton per hectare. So um, what were the results, Craig? So I hope that that's good news for, it looks like it's good news for over 70% of you. 28% of you thought it was um, 0.3 of a ton per hectare. So the majority of you thought it was bigger than it really is. And, um, and that really is, you know, I could stop my talk now because that, that's really the lesson from all these response curves that I've been looking at. But, uh, it, the, the the last you know the the fine adjustments that we make to nitrogen applications are really not don't have big consequences for um, for yield um, and in fact uh, I mean I, I I I've had to take out some of the slides from my presentation just because to save time but we've done hundreds of these experiments with farmers with farmers doing tramline trials. And what we find is that their yields vary from six tons way up to 16 tons per hectare. But for every one of those fields where they tested different amounts, it makes very little difference. You know, you don't get fields that are going from uh, when you apply an extra 60 kilograms per hectare, getting an extra ton. It just doesn't happen. So um, it, it, the yields that you're getting are something to do with other than nitrogen. That, you know, obviously the, the first, um, you know, the, the, the first 100 kilograms is pretty darn essential, but it's the fine tuning above the 100 kilograms per hectare is, is not hugely influential on your yield. It affects your gross margin as well. Uh, 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 have a look at in a minute. But the second thing about this graph is it's got, um, I've got the protein response. And what happens to protein as the response to yield flattens off, the protein response remains fairly steep. And that's actually very useful. You can keep monitoring your protein or your grain nitrogen levels uh, to tell you whether you're getting your fertilizer strategy right or not. And if you're generally getting low levels compared to that particular variety from your local variety trials, say, then that means you're probably under fertilizing and vice versa. So if you're getting high protein or high grain nitrogen levels in relation to the general norm for your part of the world, and I know levels are lower in Scotland than they are in England, um, but so I would ask, uh, I would suggest that you should be benchmarking yourselves against local farms. But if your levels are generally low, you're probably under fertilizing. 
So, and it's that's really useful. Now, the variation uh, that we see in these response curves is absolutely enormous. So this is 50 uh, different experiments that we did on winter wheat about 15 years ago. Um, yield levels haven't really changed overall in that time. Um, and, and we, you know, I'm sure if we did the same 50 experiments in the same 50 places, we get just as much uh, variation. You can see we've got sites here which produce 13 tons without any nitrogen applied. So they didn't need any application of, of, of fertilizer at all. And that's generally what we see. We go, we go out onto fields which we assume will respond to nitrogen, and we find that 10 or 15 percent of them just don't respond. So uh, you need to recognize that that could be happening on your farm. And so you need to be taking the measurements to try and um, to test whether that's true or not. Um, so the huge variation. And just to show you that it's actually the soil supply that's the main uh, component of that variation. Um, what we've done here is to represent the same responses but just adding the nitrogen that we get from the soil to the nitrogen that we've applied, and it brings the graphs all sort of more together. Obviously, the yield variation at the, uh, the right-hand side of the diagram is still pretty much the same, but very little of that yield variation is associated with uh, levels of nitrogen applied. The optima generally are slightly higher for the higher yields, but it's not a huge adjustment. So um, I'm afraid that you have to factor in that you are going to be wrong. And, and this is actually this graph is against me more than against you, because this I've put my whole sort of life's work into trying to get the recommendations right. And I know that 50 percent of the time I'm you know, the recommendations are not right. This is the best we can do. So this is the recommendations from RB209, but informed by soil mineral nitrogen analysis, which is the best way we can assess soil nitrogen supply. And what we, this, is, this graph shows the, the differences between the actual optima and the predicted, uh, what I've called best decision, so the recommended optima. And the, the differences range from you know, nearly 200 kilograms too much to 150 kilograms too little. That's the error that we have in our recommendations. Uh, half of them are close to being right. So the losses, the economic losses are not huge from getting from, from these small errors. It's the large errors that are uh, that's important. And those are the ones that we have to try and monitor uh, soil supply, recognize yield level, recognize grain concentrations, and try to work to get those, eliminate those ones. Right. So now um, th th this next graph really is uh, repeats the message that Mark gave you earlier, that you're actually uh, still probably better off than you were a few years ago. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, they're not exactly the same values that Mark used, but uh, if we take the average response curve that I showed you earlier in orange, um, and we now express it in terms of margin over nitrogen cost, then the margin over nitrogen cost is about 1,300 pounds uh, per hectare if the grain was valued at 150 pounds and the ammonium nitrate 260 pounds, which gives us a break-even ratio of five to one. So the, the right optimum then is about 200 kilograms per hectare. If the, and then about, I mean, that's probably, I sort of think of that as about two years ago, then about one year ago, the grain prices were sort of, they went up, but so did ammonia nitrate prices, but they were both sort of in sync. So the break-even ratio was still about five to one and the optimum amount to apply was about uh, 200 kilograms per hectare. And now the fertilizer has doubled in price. So uh, the, the quantity of nitrogen, the optimum amount of nitrogen is 50 kilograms less, um, but and the grain value is, is similar uh, as it was, um, but that means that the, the return compared with where we were two years ago, the return is still sort of um, 300 pounds per hectare better off. So um, it's not all bad news. Um, so uh, just to... Uh, 
a, an explanation of, uh, again, just to make sure everybody's got it, how you calculate a break-even ratio, uh, you need to consider the not the, necessarily the price that you bought the fertilizer at, but the price that it's sort of replacement cost. That's the way we think it's probably best to, to think about your nitrogen. I mean, in the end, it's up to you whether you want to sort of discount that any resale value that your fertilizer has. But... Uh, and again, you've got to sort of take a view of what the value of the crop is going to be come harvest 2022. Um, but then the break-even ratio is just the ratio of the two. So it's the nitrogen cost in pounds per kilogram, um, which is the fertilizer price divided by the fertilizer nutrient content, and then the, the, the grain value in pounds per a kilogram. So that, that's in 200 pounds per ton, that's 20 pence per kilogram. Um, so, uh, and then you can, you, because the, the response curves for cereals and oil seeds are different. And also I've seen uh, Alex Sinclair, I had an interchange with him over the weekend, and he's, he's thinking that the response curves for barley are different from wheat. Um, I, I couldn't convince myself of that when I looked at the response curves for the HDB in the last few weeks. Um, we did a report for them, which you can find on the HDB website. So uh, I, I've been considering that cereals respond pretty much in the same way. So that, that just means the shape of the response is very similar for all cereals. And that, if we start at five to one, that means that by the time you get to 10 to one, you're reducing by 50 kilograms per hectare. But this graph allows you to see how to make adjustments um, for all different break-even ratios. And you can see that because the oilseed response curve is actually flatter than the cereal response curve, then you need to make bigger adjustments for oil seeds than you do for cereals. So uh, oil seeds starts at two and a half to one. And uh, if you double the price of fertilizer, it, it brings the uh, oil seed uh, break even ratio to five to one. So the adjustment for oil seeds, assuming that the, I mean, I know the oil seed price has increased, but if you ignore that for the time being, then the adjustment for oil seeds should be nearly 70 kilograms per hectare. Um, but because the oil seed price has gone up, then actually it's the, the round figure for both oil seeds and cereals adjustment this year is 50 kilograms per hectare less than uh, assuming you were fertilizing economically last year than you did last year. Um, we, we produced this, to, uh, this is another way of producing the same information. So we, we're in, we've just done a report for the HDB, as I said, and this table is in the uh, report that is on the HDB website. The HDB has also produced a calculator from this uh, this table so that you can work out what reduction should be. And there's a set, there's separate calculations for oil seeds and for cereals. Um, so I, I hope that that's given you a sort of reasonable picture of the sort of economic calculations. And now I want to sort of move on to the implications of that. So the, the first implication is that any errors that you make now are going to be more expensive than the errors you made last year. So, and you will make errors. So it puts greater value on monitoring your fields, your soils, uh, soil nitrogen levels, your uh, productivity levels, and you need to put greater effort into trying to improve the efficiency of your manures and your fertilizers. That that's all becomes, you know, everything comes into sharper focus. So you need to know your organic matter levels, ideally your soil mineral end levels, and, and you can actually get estimates now of your mineralization capacity of your organic matter. Um, it, clearly, yield levels are important. Any instances of lodging or um, uh, or very different uh, behavior of your crops in the field, need, you need to register that. I'm a great advocate for the value of monitoring the nutrients that you harvest. You spend so much money on fertilizers, and I cannot understand why generally across the world nobody actually monitors the nutrients that they harvest. Um, 
And, and you can do that very simply by just analyzing the grain field by field rather than, you know, from the whole heap in the in the shed or in the silo. You, if you monitor field by field, you can then use grain. And, and incidentally, if you didn't know, protein is just grain nitrogen multiplied by 5.7. Um, so you, it, you can work out from your protein by dividing by 5.7 what your grain nitrogen is. You multiply the grain nitrogen by the yield and it gives you the kilograms per hectare you're taking off. And then you can relate that to what you've applied and get some feel for the efficiency of your whole system. Um, and of course, there's this in-season monitoring, there's all sorts of uh, high um, sophisticated technology to help you monitor uh, canopy size, which is, uh, as I've already mentioned, very important. I, I like this. This is a, a little color chart they use in, um, in Asia for managing both wheat and rice. Um, and it tells, it sort of gauges the color of your leaves. I think we should be doing more like this. And I'm sure you do it with your eyes, but um, it's difficult to, to sort of tell anybody else what color your leaves are. But this color chart allows you to put a score on the color of your leaves. And, um, but, you know, that's important information. If you've got dark green leaves, clearly you've got a better soil, a better supplied crop than if you've got light green leaves. Um, and uh, I'm also a great believer in experimentation. We do lots of tramline trials with farmers now, and they're learning a lot about the efficacy of the different practices and the different products that they're using from doing those experiments. So if now if I move more to the, how am I doing for time, Mark? Um, so uh, let's have uh, let's close on the hour. So uh, sort of eight minutes and ten minutes for questions. Would that be all right? Yeah, yeah. So um, so if we now just sort of think a bit about farm strategy as a whole and um, how you can move to reduce the nitrogen costs for your farm. So. Uh, I mean, I've really been emphasizing this already, that lots of monitoring, uh, lots of measurement, um, those all become more valuable things to do as the price of fertilizer goes up. Um, you need to think about reducing nitrogen losses from the farm. Basically, nitrogen, you know, doesn't... Um, doesn't come and go by magic it's there's a sort of mass balance of nitrogen on the farm and um the more you can do to keep nitrogen on the farm and avoid loss unintended losses then the less you'll have to put nitrogen into the farm um, from elsewhere so you need to treat and store your manures carefully that's a whole subject that really we haven't got time to discuss today but um Growing cover crops, something that people are doing a lot more nowadays, that keeps nitrogen in the system, stops it leaching over winter. If you avoid untimely cultivations, if you're using reduced tillage or even direct drilling, then that reduces the amount of autumn mineralization. And it's generally autumn bare soils which are leached over winter. That's that's all nitrogen that you're going to have to pay for in the future. Um, choose efficient fertilizers. I've got a few uh, couple of slides on that in a minute. Um, and and use efficient uh, methods of application, and I'm going to mention that in a minute. But also, you can, I mean, this is much more strategic, but if you look at your whole farm system, then it, the more you can recycle nitrogen within the farm and not export it all in the grain that you, that you sell, then actually that's good for your fertilizer bill. So, Integrated crop and livestock management is clearly a way of saving on fertilizer, um, recycling your manure nitrogen, and you can actually choose crops that need less nitrogen. So, well, the, the example we always use is that feed wheat can actually replace, be replaced by triticale, and triticale needs, it generally yields as well, it feeds as well, and it needs less nitrogen than wheat. So, um, but there are all sorts of other options in terms of crops that don't need a lot of fertilizer. But just to come back to the point of muck, uh, as uh, Mark's figures showed earlier, it's not just nitrogen that's increased in price, but 
P and K. And um, so the the uh, cattle FYM or pig slurry are almost worth double what they used to be worth. So again, their management is supremely important. Uh, an example of you know how to improve the efficiency of spreading of, of slurries is that you can use band spreading. It allows you to spread on crops in the spring and it um, reduces not only you know the, the the complaints about odor and so on, but it reduces ammonia losses and it increases the quantity that the crop can uh, get a hold of. Um, we're just doing a review of for Defra. We haven't finished it yet, but I just want to sort of mention that there's a whole range of nitrogen efficiency products that are out there. Uh, particularly nitrification inhibitors, urease inhibitors, combinations of the two, and some slow release products. Um, I'm not going to go through all these in detail. I just wanted to point out that um, we've been doing some work with BASF, who've got a new, uh, well, not terribly new now, but urease inhibitor. Urease inhibitors are actually, you know, in the grand scheme of things, we lose more nitrogen by in the form of ammonia than we lose as nitrous oxide and, and dinitrogen into the atmosphere. So the, the, the urease inhibitors, obviously they're only relevant for urea and, and in some cases for slurries, but, um, but urease inhibitors are, do more for nitrogen efficiency than nitrification inhibitors. Um, nitrification inhibitors I'll come to in a minute, but these are these are some, uh, these again, these are tramline trials uh, dotted all over the UK, uh, done for BASF and with their product Lemus, and they, uh, they show on average a, um, this is the, this is the, uh, yield benefit over the untreated with lemus and this is with lemus applied to uh, urea and this is the with lemus applied to ammonium nitrate so um it's it's worth using with urea but not worth using with ammonium nitrate if we used move to nitrification inhibitors nitrification results in the emission of nitrous oxides uh, and nitrogen oxides, and particularly nitrous oxide, which is a very potent greenhouse gas, uh, 300 times more global warming than carbon dioxide. So it's a very important greenhouse gas. We don't actually lose a lot of our fertilizer as nitrous oxide. We, uh, these, these emissions here, look, are one, two, or three kilograms per hectare, up to sort of nearly four kilograms per hectare. So it's not huge quantities, but the inhibitors are very effective. On average, 44% reduction in emissions of nitrous oxide uh, using these inhibitors. So, um, and there's several of them. So um, they're worth doing for uh, sort of more really for climate change mitigation than for nitrogen efficiency. So I'm now going to try and finish, Mark. I hope that's um, not gone too long, but uh, I mean, this graph is just reiterating the point that, um, that I said earlier, that nitrogen doesn't really cause high yields. So these are all our yields from the yield enhancement network. So they, they range between seven tons to 17 tons per hectare. Uh, their average is about 11 tons per hectare. There's a very vague positive trend in there. It's not like the high yields are dependent on vast quantities of nitrogen. Um, so don't be afraid to cut nitrogen rates back. Um, nitrogen is, is a way of supporting yield, not really building yield, um, tons and tons of yield. Um, recognize that your farm may be different. So monitoring is important. Benchmarking your farm against other farms is important. High prices make your errors more expensive, so it's worth doing, putting the effort into trying to avoid the errors, doing using grain analysis, considering some tramline testing, even maybe. Um, and uh, this is the question I was sort of uh, prompted at the beginning. Um, clearly, the, the nitrogen has all sorts of costs 
over and above its economic costs to, to us in the farming uh, community. So uh, the environmental costs are, uh, are very big and becoming more and more uh, prominent in everybody's minds. And we need to take a view, I think, on how we manage nitrogen uh, into the future, given those costs. And even if these the prices come back down again next year, I would actually predict that they, they will um, when, when the energy supplies sort themselves out. But, um, but we still have to have in mind that nitrogen does have significant costs to it. So thank you very much. And um, just a quick mention of all our uh, yens, which are, which are there to sort of help you and interest you. And, and I'm trying to sell monitoring and knowledge of information about crops. And that's what they're all about. So thank you very much. That's super, Roger. Thank you. Um, great to have a, a scientific mind applied to the discussion. Um, I've, I've, uh, there's one take home message for me, which I'll end on, which I sort of picked up in your uh, talk, which is great. And I'll share that. Um, there are a few comments on uh, Q&A, which we'll just run through. I've got three here. So the first question was, is it worth considering delaying winter plowing in order to avoid winter leaching losses of nutrients? Um, I suppose I've got an opinion on that. Do you, what about you, Roger? Well, is I, it I mean, worth considering delaying winter ploughing in order to avoid winter leaching losses of nutrients? Uh, I can imagine de delaying winter ploughing would be would have lots of knock on risks and consequences that that I would be very nervous about. But um, I suppose it but, depends on soil type. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So he heavy land, um, the risks would be higher, I guess, mm -hmm. and. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I mean, it will definitely help you retain nitrogen in the system. Mm. And a pointer, perhaps, too, that um, cover cropping, uh, if you get the chance uh, on land that's uh, going to be set there before spring uh, cropping's due on, could potentially retain 30, 40 kgs of N. Yeah. That might yeah. be lost. Um, yeah. So that's the sort of mitigation which some people are adopting already. Um, uh, this one I like. Uh, are margins better if you put on 50 kgs too much or if you put on 50 kgs too little? <laughs> <laughs> Depends on a lot of things. <laughs> yeah. The, the, well, assuming you know what the right number is, yeah. um, which we never do, um, that the answer is it, you're better off putting on two, uh, 50 kilograms too much, uh, and uh, but only very slightly. And... Um, uh, I mean, I've studied this a lot, looking at those errors and how, you know, what it's what you should be doing with your strategy, given that we're likely to be making errors. And the answer was, well, I did it. I did the sums and they're not going to be different now, really. I did them about 12 years ago, 2009, when the prices were going up. And um, the answer was you should apply about 10 or 11 kilograms more than the perfect optimum if you mm. know what the perfect yeah is. so i read that that you know economic optimum is uh is great on paper but the risk and uncertainty means you yeah. have some sort of margin in there i mean it's um you know it, it lose when i was talking about those bar charts and is there anything we can do to increase margin what we're saying is actually that your 0.3 ton response from that last 50 kgs of n Actually, at the cost of six ninety a ton and at the cost of two hundred and ten pounds a ton, if you you'll increase your that margin on those uh, charts by another thirty seven pounds a hectare, because that last fifty kg at those prices isn't showing a response. That's what we're saying. I, well, I haven't done the sum. I've just done uh, it. Just done <laughs> so. As long as you, you multiply 0. 0.3 by 200, so, uh, well, 0. Yeah, yeah, yeah. by 200, which gives you um, uh, 0. 0.6. Yeah. Uh, sorry, so it gives you 60, 60 63. Pounds. 63 pounds, 63 yeah. 63 pounds, and then you took off... Um, 50 kgs... Um, uh, 50 kgs at 690 a ton is 100 pounds a hectare 
Um, take yeah. off your 63, leaves your 37. So yeah. on paper, um, yeah. you can make even more money. Yeah. Um, there's one more question here. I'll probably, uh, Craig, uh, could I bring you in on this one, on the available ma nutrient management tools that we can recommend perhaps other than Planet? I know we use Planet in-house quite a bit. Uh, do you have a, a comment on that, Craig? Yeah, definitely. Um, let me put my camera on. Um, the difficult thing with this is that the Planet is one of the only softwares that they support Scottish MVZ rules, because obviously between uh, a lot of the English systems, uh, Roger, I'm not too sure. Well, you guys use Planet as well, but obviously we'll have the likes of Greenlight Grower and, and Muddy Boots. And, and the, the new alternative is, is that they're all using RB209 recommendations from MVZ. So uh, I have no personal experience of using the others, but I know Planet's fantastic when it, when it can be used um, and when you know how to use it. But I do appreciate that it's not the most easiest of things to, 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 to navigate your way through. But um, a note on that is there is the Planet Helpline is supported by the Farm Advisory Service. So if you do want to want a wee bit of help on it, uh, myself and the rest, of, the rest of the Planet Advisory team are available through the Farm Advisory Service help, Helpline number. Um, so yeah, by all means, pick up the phone and see if there's anything we can we can help you guys with. Okay. Roger, do, you, do you use any other ones, Roger? Or? Sorry, uh, do, do you use I, I've other? not really got anything to add there, Craig. Yeah. Um, th there was a note that actually, if you are cutting back on N, probably avoid um, putting on once you're getting into stem extensions at growth stage 32, because the yield contribution drops off. Other than milling wheats, is you know, what do we do on the milling wheat scenario for protein that we don't grow a lot of bread making wheat up here, but. Um, you're usually putting on sort of 40 kgs on the leaf, aren't you, in that scenario on the flag leaf? Um, yeah, not everybody does. I mean, and, and again, this is something that, I mean, farms have come to recognise that they're either good or bad at producing high-protein grain. Uh, I actually think that means that they they either generally over-fertilise or they generally under-fertilise. So, um, but, uh, yeah, they they think of it in, an, in another way. Um, I mean, we're going to have to accept that 50 kilograms, if we reduce nitrogen by 50 kilograms on milling wheat before we add any extra, and, and the, uh, the, the baking industry insists on having 13%, then we're going to have to, uh, I mean, they're going to have to pay for it. You know, the, uh, or, and if we're going to have to try and meet 13%, we're going to have to apply a lot more than we are at the moment. Uh, yeah. But, but it's not just, you know, it's it, you, you have to justify it on the basis of the premium you expect and your chances of getting that premium. And it may not be worth growing milling wheat. Mm, mm, mm. Um, just, uh, I know we said we had a sort of uh, arable bias on here, but in terms of, of silage uh, grass response, Craig, you sort of raised the other day that actually what's in the pit is what you've got and can you afford to actually cut back at all, given that, um, you know, if you haven't got the silage in the pit, you've got to buy something else in. Is that, what's the feeling on forage? quite a difficult one in that I suppose it will always be a bit of a case of all the, the more nitrogen you go, the more the more grass you're going to grow. But I suppose it's, it's the wider situation uh, in terms of, as you said, Roger, earlier, increasing that nitrogen efficiency. And this is probably going to be the year that if you do need to cut back on, on fertiliser, then why not have a look at pH? Why not get the rest of things right and actually value um, the amount or, or make sure you are made, valuing the amount that's coming through your muck and slurries and stuff? So. Um, there was a comment there earlier about maybe producing a webinar on grassland um, fertilizer, and the same as what we've done today. So we'll maybe go away and have a look at that. So, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, have a bigger topic. Well, we're up on the hour. I think it's probably um, a good place to draw things to a close. Um, uh, thank you very much, Roger, uh, for, for giving uh, of your time. Um, it's much appreciated. Um, take home messages. I think we've really sort of covered them off. Um, we've got an idea as to what that, that last uh, 50 kgs gives us back. Um, errors are more expensive uh, in these scenarios. Um, and uh, that 50 kgs actually contributes less than, than we anticipated as a group. Um, um, 
And of course, it th does raise a question whether we should be looking at future grain markets and locking into those prices that are there is a way of sort of underwriting what we're potentially going to be paying for our fertilizer to keep those margins up. Um, uh, questions we've dealt with, uh, I think there is, Craig, do you just want to um, run through the yeah. response? Thank you, Mark. As always, um, this meeting has been funded by the Scottish Farm Advisory Service and in order for us to deliver that, uh, they love to see the feedback. Um, so there will be an email sent out either well, within the next 24 hours um, asking for your feedback. Uh, so it would be much appreciated if you can fill that in. Um, and there is a prize draw for £50 for either the Battlefield Bakery or Damn Delicious. So you'll win a, a, a raffle to win that for, for the month. So that gets given away uh, every month. So. Um, by all means, please um, answer the feedback forms uh, because they're very important. The other thing I was just going to say was on the 16th of December, we've got another webinar coming up um, looking at infrastructures and farm buildings and whatnot. But the reason I was mentioning in this webinar was about the uh, CPA is going to be in attendance at that as well, just to talk about the new restrictions that are going to be coming in uh, over the next five years in terms of spreading slurry and slurry storage and whatnot. So all very pertinent with what we've talked about today in terms of maximising nitrogen um, efficiency. So, um, yeah, without further ado, um, thank you, Mark, uh, for chairing. And thank you very much, Roger, um, for, for speaking today. It's been fantastic. And hopefully uh, there's been some great take home messages from today and people can have a, have a think about what, uh, what they're going to do going forward. Yes, thank you. Thank you for dialing in. Thanks all.